told a few friends privately that I'd had abortions, but it was secrecy that had silenced me. And so, and this is where bravery and subversion come in. Because I believe that the most subversive thing a woman can do is to talk about her life as if it really matters. Because it does. I didn't think that Jean T had shown contempt for me. In his mind, I had moved on from the type of girl who might say no to the type who had undoubtedly said yes. I received it the next day. Pregnancy certificate of Mademoiselle Annie Duchenne. Date of delivery, July 8th, 1964. I saw summer, sunshine. I tore up the certificate. On the second evening, it was raining. I stood alone in the street, under my umbrella, scanning the newspaper pages pinned up on the wall, on a board protected by wire meshing, checking out both ends of the Rue de l'Hôpital. LB was someplace in Rouen. She was the only woman who could save me, and she was nowhere to be found. Every morning on waking up, I imagined the feeling of nausea had, had gone. But seconds later, it would well up inside me like a dark, sinister wave. I was seized with both desire and disgust for food. One day, walking past a butcher's, I spotted some salami in the window. I immediately went in, bought some, and wolfed it down on the sidewalk. I have no right to mention their names because I'm not dealing with fictional characters, but real people. Yet I find it hard to believe they are living somewhere out there. In a way, I'm right. What makes up their life today, their physical appearance, their opinions, their bank accounts, bears no resemblance to the life they led back in the 60s, the one I can see as I write. As soon as I feel like looking up their names in the electronic phone book, I realize this would be a mistake. I felt that nothing in my life had changed. In my diary I wrote, I feel that my pregnancy is totally abstract. I touch my belly, I know it's there, but that's as far as my imagination will go. If I let time have its way, by next July they'll be pulling the child out of me. But I can't feel it at all. But the reason for my wanting to do this, the fact that she really does exist and deserves to be commended for her behavior, is precisely the reason that stops me from doing so. I have no right to expose a real living woman like LB. I have just checked in the phone book, using a public medium such as a book, exercising a right which is not reciprocated. She could quite rightly claim that she didn't ask me for anything. I turned all my attention to sport, hoping that my strenuous efforts or maybe even a fall might dislodge that thing making it unnecessary for me to visit the woman in the 17th arrondissement. When Anique lent me her skiing gear, <clears throat> which I couldn't afford to hire, I would repeatedly tumble, imagining each time I did that I was inflicting the fall that would save me. I think I began this story because I wanted to follow the path leading up to those images of January 64 in the 17th arrondissement. Similarly, when I was 15, my whole life hinged on one or two images of me in the future, making love, traveling to faraway countries. I have no idea which words will come to me. I have no idea where my writing will take me. I would like to stall this moment and remain in a state of expectancy. Maybe I'm afraid that the act of writing will shatter this vision, just like sexual fantasies fade as soon as we have climaxed. I can't believe this is happening to me, and I don't think I can take it. The motion we went through that night came to us naturally. They seemed the only thing to do at the time. Nothing about her bourgeois ideals or her beliefs had prepared O to sever the umbilical cord of a three-month-old fetus. Today she may have dismissed this episode as a temporary aberration, an inexplicable moment of chaos in her life. She may also hold anti-abortion views, but it was she, and she alone, who stood by my side that night, her small face crumpled with tears, acting as an improvised midwife in room 17 of the girls' dormitory. 
He sat down on my bed and grabbed my chin. Why did you do it? How did you do it? Answer me. His glaring eyes bore into me. I begged him not to let me die. Look at me. Promise me you'll never do it again. Never. Because of his wild expression, I believed he might actually let me die. The corridor was a scene of frenzied agitation revolving around the food court. At regular intervals, a woman's voice rang out. Custard for Madame X or Madame Y, who is breastfeeding, as if it were some kind of privilege. I felt saved. Among all the social and psychological reasons that may account for my past, of one I am certain, these things happened to me so that I might recount them. Maybe the true purpose of my life is for my body, my sensations, and my thoughts to become writing. In other words, something intelligible and universal, causing my existence to merge into the lives and heads of other people.